I'd like to begin by asking each of you to discuss your career paths and how you each got into journalism. Let's start with Erica. Uh, I knew I was going to be. <laughs> um, so my, my career path. So my first brush with journalism um, was when I was seven years old living in Baltimore City. Um, and I met my first reporter on my porch uh, who had come to cover maybe the worst day in my family's lives. Um, the first story that I read was in the Baltimore Sun um, as, a young, as a young girl. Uh, where two reporters were describing um, my mother's trial in the courthouse. <laughs> um, and I will never forget that they described her as appearing haggard um, mm. in the courtroom. And I was eight then, and I, I never forgot it. And I was absolutely fascinated by how someone could take um, what the details of your life and what happened in your house and put it out for the world to see. And I was very intrigued um, and really wanted to know <laughs> how they were able to do that. Um, I, you know, I love to write um, when I lost everything, um, my teachers and, and my support system told me that no one could take away a gift, um, which, was, which was writing. And so I wrote my way through um, a lot of, of hardship um, I eventually, you know, I made my way through the foster care system. Um, I was taken in by teachers, um, particularly in high school, who helped me get to college. Um, I went to Goucher College. I did not study journalism. I studied communications and political science. Um, I interned at the Baltimore Sun during that time um, doing podcasts. I was not good enough to write. They told me, which I really like to remind them of, um, any chance I get. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, I was told to go to Northwestern or Columbia if I wanted to, to, to come back and write. And so I, I had never even heard of those schools, um, uh, but I applied and did my due diligence. Um, I attended Northwestern for graduate school um, and graduated in 2009. Um, went back to the sun and said, okay, I did what you told me to do. Um, <laughs> and I, uh, and they said, okay, well, you should write, you know, you should, you should write somewhere else first. Um, and so I, I worked for a small weekly newspaper in Frederick, Maryland. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, for, I'm back in Maryland now um, for about 15 months before um, the sun hired me. To, to cover education, or actually they did not hire me to cover education. They just hired me to replace um, veteran journalists that they had let go from the newsroom. Um, and I was just the younger, cheaper <laughs> uh, talent. And um, I was assigned, you know, one education story because no one else wanted to do it. And um, I know there was no one else to, to cover it. And next thing I knew, uh, on the Baltimore Sun website, it said I was the education reporter. And that was 10 years ago. <laughs> and I've never looked back. Um, and at the times, I mean, I was doing my thing in Baltimore, um, had never even uh, thought of working at, at the New York Times. Um, I actually always thought that if I went anywhere, it would be the Washington Post. <laughs> that was a dream. Not too late. I know. Well, I was I was minding my own business, doing my school board story, um, when a, an email from the New York Times dropped into my inbox, and I was terrified. Um, and I never thought I would leave the Baltimore Sun. I never had any plans to. I would go out when the lights went out. Um, and luckily, I had a lot of people uh, at the Times who who believed in me and um, told me that the only thing that was holding me back was myself. And um, and March 2010, four, four years ago, or I'm sorry, March 2017, four years ago this month, um, I was on my way. Amazing, thank you so much for that. Um, how about Tracy's next? I'm still marveling over the fact that we're all in this panel together because I did not know Erica's personal story. Um, I have, we have mutual friends, many of them in common with Emily, with Erica, and I've just long admired these women 
both personally and professionally women who I follow on social media. So it's so fantastic to be here with both of you. Um, I would say I am lucky that I fell into journalism. I was a nosy ass kid and it was a way to get paid. And my parents were the kind of Asian parents that kind of let me do my own thing, which I know for a lot of my um, colleagues, they were forced to go to law school before they could become journalists or forced to try other things that were considered more lucrative, perhaps more prestigious before they decided they really wanted to be in journalism. Um, my parents just said, as long as you support yourself, do whatever. So um, I got here through um, many different internships. My very first was at the Palo Alto Weekly, um, just a few blocks away from Stanford University. After college, I did a Fulbright in Taiwan. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I still do someday. So it was a chance to live abroad and use my Mandarin Chinese language skills to report. It was really, really difficult to talk to officials. I grew up speaking Chinese in my home, but to interview people at that level, they always asked me, you know, what is wrong with you? Because on the phone, I had, I didn't have an American accent. I could speak Chinese, but my vocabulary was not great. It was not, it was very colloquial. So that was a good experience. My first job job was at the Oregonian where I was um, there for four years. And I spent the longest of my career at the Boston Globe. I feel like I grew up there um, first in Boston covering education and then higher education before coming down to Washington in 2011 for the 2012 campaign, um, where I, it was my first dip into national politics. I'd never done it before, never thought I would be good at it, but you know, the editors gave me an opportunity and I seized it to try to make it what I wanted it to be. Um, in 2016, the Post reached out about this new job that they wanted to create on the intersection of race and the economy, which we could talk more about later. And I was like, that is my dream job. So yes, <laughs> and here I am. Amazing, thank you so much for sharing. Tracy and finally, Emily, I'd love to hear your story. Yeah, first of all, these are amazing stories. I had no idea either of your trajectories. So that's incredible. Um, I mean, mine is um, uh, pretty straightforward. My parents were both political journalists and I never considered doing anything else. <laughs> my dad produced what was then the McNeil Lair News Hour for 30 years in DC. Uh, my mom was a Washington correspondent who worked her way up from covering, you know, from being stuck in the women's pages to like begging to cover Geraldine Ferraro's, uh, you know, race for the vice presidency, you know, covering Hillary Clinton. She had to sort of cover all these women in order to be taken seriously to get to cover everybody in politics. Um, and actually, Tracy and I really became close because Tracy moved into my mom's old office at the Boston Globe in DC and found in a closet some childhood painting that I had made that my mother had discarded when she retired. So like a really great model there, leaving her child's art in the Boston Globe offices, but Tracy found it and sent it to me, which is, and now it's hanging in my daughter's, my little girl's bedroom. So it's like such a sweet Aww. circle. Um, but I, my, I went to Northwestern because, as Erica said, that's what everybody told you you were supposed to do uh, if you had that opportunity. Um, I, my first journalism job was at the Dallas Morning News, covering like cat shows and you know the far exurbs of Dallas. And I sort of just, you know paid my dues at $27,700 a year um, and uh, tried to keep working my way up. They ended up sending me to Texas uh, to um, Austin to cover the state legislature. I fell in love with state politics. And several years later helped uh, found the Texas Tribune, which was an, uh, then sort of a novel nonprofit newsroom serving Texas. Um, and about four years ago, I was on maternity leave with a baby girl and I just could not get this, you know, Hillary Clinton was running against Donald Trump. There were so many headlines around like electability and likability for women that felt to me so fundamentally sexist. And I thought sort of in that moment, boy, we should start like a new national newsroom of record for women. And then I like went back into the depths of postpartum depression and did not think about it again <laughs> for honestly four years. And four years later, you know, there were more women than ever on the 2020 stage and in particular more women of color on the 2020 stage. And the conversation was still about electability and likability and also had this added bonus of, is she too ambitious? Does she want it too much? Which was like the added layer of, to me, racism on top of the, you know, very basic sexism. And in that moment, I decided to try to take the leap and launch something brand new, which is the 19th, which we kicked off officially um, in August, which is uh, where we uh, call the nation's first nonprofit um, newsroom at the intersection of gender, politics, and policy. 
So um, hopefully uh, Erica and Tracy will someday, uh, you know, be uh, drink the Kool-Aid and come along with us on this adventure, but it's been a pretty wild ride for the last six months. Was that a job offer? <laughs> <laughs> I've, made, I've made multiple already. Ever the editor, ever the editor. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing for sharing your stories. We, we do have some students who have joined us on this webinar, and I'm sure they appreciate hearing about career paths. But even as an, uh, someone who's not a journalist, it's always interesting to hear how you got where you are. Um, so now we'll get into the meat of the discussion about race and media. Um, so I started with Erica before, so maybe I'll move to Tracy first. Can you tell us a bit more um, about your beat, um, about sort of the intersection of race and economy and sort of why it was the dream come true for you? Sure, um, having been a Washington correspondent for at that time, four years, I'd gone on maternity leave. I was on a fellowship in Ann Arbor at the Knight Wallace Fellowship for uh, nine months. That really got me thinking, you know, this is your life, do what you wanna do with it. I liked what I was doing in political journalism, but um, for a lot of folks, being a political journalist in Washington is like the pinnacle of journalism dreams. For me, I'd always been interested in race and inequality and in that intersection. And it's been part of every job that I've had, um, whether it was covering education, which is where you could really see this play out to covering politics. You know, we were uh, calling Trump out on his racist speech um, when he was running for president. And we were focusing on different communities and how that speech was empowering him and helping him get um, support. But what, what was it doing to certain communities? I was focusing on Muslims in, in Florida where they were, um, there was a mosque that was going to be the first mosque in Florida to be a polling site. And you know, because of all the racist attacks that were directed towards them after it became public that they were gonna be a polling site, the um, election people just said, no, we're not gonna do that anymore. I spent a week there talking to the president of the mosque, talking to different hate groups, actually going to hate group meetings um, to really delve into this rhetoric and this type of thinking and how it was impacting every real people. So when the Washington Post said they were going to, they were interested in creating this race and econ beat, I jumped at the opportunity. It was a chance to kind of make it my own. You know, you, you propose what you would like to do with it. And um, I just feel very fortunate. I remember there were mentors, editors of mine who asked me, are you sure? Like, why do you want to leave politics for this? And I just said, it's everything I've been doing for the last, at that time, I don't know, it's been 20 something years since I've been in this job, in this journalism business. So it really was like something I felt like I was meant, meant to do. Excellent. That's what we're all sort of searching for, isn't it? <laughs> Finding what we're meant to do and then actually being able to do it. Um, so now I'll transition over to Erica. You're not first this time. Um, I did want to discuss uh, your focus on education um, and education really does expose the fault lines um, in America and racial disparities. Um, and I'd love you to discuss more about that. And if you have a particular uh, article that you wrote that you'd like to discuss that sort of really uh, shines a light on the racial disparities in education, I'd love to hear about it. Sure. So, I mean, you know, <clears throat> race is infused in, in this beat because the education system that exists today was literally created by force through the courts because of racial to, to break up segregation, right? So um and 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 frankly that that system that has that was created um was never balanced. It was never balanced, it never tipped in the favor of the students that it was it was d designed for. Um, and so, you know, coming from that, that very basic understanding of the education system that exists today, it just, we have no choice. I mean, I don't cover black students um, or, or children of color in general because I'm a person of color. I, co I, I cover it because that is the story. Um, in this, you know, of education in this country. Um, I don't cover um, students of color for for pity, I, I cover it because they are they they don't they are not getting and arguably never have 
um, gotten what they are entitled to and deserved under law. So, um, so I do, you know, especially at the times, um, you know, I have tended to, to write stories um, that put children who are underserved, who are by, by, by systems, right? Not just by thin air, um, but by, by policies, by, by government officials, by educators um, at the forefront. And, and, and I take great pride in that. And, and I will say, you know, when I was considering going to the Times from, from the Sun, um, and I was very scared and I was really nervous that I was not gonna be able to do the kind of work that I knew needed to be done because it was a national paper, because of its own history, um, because there weren't even many reporters who looked like me at that institution. Um, I thought I was going to, to lose the ability to do that, um, where it was much easier to do it in Baltimore City, right? Um, but, but I made it my mission to, to get as many children of color on the front page of that paper as I could um, for, for, for the right reasons, which doesn't always mean that it's a positive <laughs> story, um, but for the right reasons and that's justice. And so I'll point to two stories. Um, the first is a uh, black girl story, which, is, uh, which was pretty, um, that landed really big. And I think, and, and for a variety of reasons though, right? I think um, it's a, that's a population that is undercovered. Um, their plight, as I said in the story, um, very much ignored for a very long time. But it also, that story, you know, it, it exposed the, the, the deep inequities um, in the school system. It exposed disparate discipline. Um, and disparate treatment of, you know, boys and girls. But it also landed in that way because um, Black girls do not see themselves in the New York Times. Um, and so for them to be, excuse me, my daughter's school. Um, <laughs> uh, so, so for them to be reflected and for their, their struggles to be respected um, in the way that, that it was, um, it was really, it was, it was, it was really monumental, I think. Um, I'll point to also the TM Landry investigation. That was really difficult for me. Um, it was difficult personally and professionally to do that story, um, because I was, I, I was very concerned that I was perpetuating a narrative that, uh, Black children, especially poor Black children, did not belong at institutions like Stanford. Um, and I, you know, I almost did not do that story. <laughs> I, I think I quit that story about three times before it um, actually hit the paper. Um, but what, you know, I think what that story did was yes, it exposed the injustices that these students were facing within their own school. That was very much, you know, had to do with race. Um, but it also exposed the injustices that students that they experience and that students like them across this country experience um, as they try to um, climb the ladder of, of opportunity to elite institutions. I think it was an indictment of, of the whole system um, just as much as it was the, the, the subjects of the story. Um, so, you know, that's how I tend to think about the education beat. Um, what does it say about the systems that have been created in this country to help the next generation of children thrive. And unfortunately um, for black children and children of color, um, it, it was designed to, to keep them exactly where they are. Um, and I think it, you know, the education beat has evolved to confront that more head on. I would say when I started 10 years ago, I would probably would not have had the courage to write either either of those stories. Um, but you know, if you're covering education without confronting race, um, you should not be covering education. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you. Those, I'm so glad that you did have the courage to write those two stories because they are so worth reading. And um, we dropped them in the chat. I think we might have dropped it twice. We got so excited <laughs> about them. Um, and we'll follow up with an email to our attendees so that they can read them as well. They were incredible because it's very true what you wrote that there's a lot of attention on black boys um, but not so much on the black girls and the, and the black girls in the article that you wrote about were being punished because they were giddy, because they were excited, like. Because of who they, they were. were. Because of who they yeah. were, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And that Landry piece was just like beyond. So everybody should read it. <laughs> um, Emily, uh, you did, you discussed a bit about the 19th and the origins of the 19th. I know that you were very intentional when building your team. Can you talk about that um, and how race came into play when you were, when you were building your, your team at your new media company? Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, first I want to say that not only is the work that Erica and Tracy are producing extraordinary, but they're also uh, bringing race into these conversations in legacy newsrooms that have been grappling with the ways to continue to tell those stories. And I think the fact that these women have been at the forefront of in many ways sort of pushing that boulder up the hill is also worth recognizing. So um, anyway, you're both amazing. I'm in awe of you. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so like I'm the white lady here talking about this. So obviously put that in the context, take it through my lens. But um, you know, I think when we started to think about the 19th, we recognized pretty quickly that you know two thirds of politics and policy editors and reporters are men and almost all of them are white. Um, and uh, if our aim is to have newsrooms that accurately reflect uh, the communities that we're trying to serve, we are so far from, from making that mark. And so the vision for the 19th was Look, like I've benefited from all of the, the privilege that has been afforded to me uh, in this industry, whether it was going to Northwestern, you know, whether it was getting the internships and then getting the jobs and then getting to advance through these ranks. Um, I want to devote the next chapter, hopefully the next half of my career, to trying to see if I can use that privilege to elevate people who have been marginalized in this industry and among our readership for far too long. So what does that look like? Can you build a newsroom from scratch that accurately reflects the diversity of the nation's women, that accurately reflects uh, the gender diversity of LGBTQ people? I believe that you can. So, And it's a luxury, candidly, to start this from the ground floor without the institutional baggage. So, you know, at the 19th, our newsroom is 70, more than 70 percent women of color, mostly black, black and brown women. Um, you know, we employ one of the only openly transgender uh, non-binary reporters in the country and elevate that work onto a pretty incredible level. Um, if you can start from there, can you truly build audiences that, that reflect, um, you know, the communities that you're trying to serve? And so, yes, we're intentional about it. We're intentional about it, not just with our hiring, we're intentional about it with our storytelling. We're intentional about making sure that the people uh, we're trying to serve see themselves in our stories, in our social media engagements, in our in our live events. Um, so all those things are critical. I mean, it's I, not many news organizations nationally have successfully attracted a demographically diverse audience, not to mention an ideologically diverse audience. These are really tough things to do. This is an experiment in many ways, um, but I think it starts with saying, with hiring a newsroom and saying, bring your full self to this work. Um, you know, bring your lived experiences. That's not a liability for us. And we have had the luxury of also being able to say we're a newsroom that stands for things. You know, yes, we care about the ideological diversity of our of our you know coverage and our readership, but like we also stand for gender equity and we stand for racial justice and we stand for human rights. Um, and and I think it's okay to to launch a news organization that sort of has that bright line, draws that bright line, um, and, and says you know here's who we are and here's here's what we won't stand for. Um, so it's been a gift in a lot of ways um, for us, and it's been incredible. I'm learning so much every single day. Um, yeah, it's been a really a joy. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. Um, so now I have a couple of questions and it will, will go to the chat as well or the Q&A because we definitely want audience participation here. Um, so if you each could touch upon um, how race considerations inform and or shape your work from the stories that you choose to pursue to how you edit articles. Maybe Tracy, we'll start with you. Sure, I, I want to also jump on what Erica and Emily have said about being very intentional and in how we approach this. It's, um, you know, back in the 90s, it was trendy for newsrooms to have race teams. 
And then people kind of moved away from that. Um, I personally feel privileged to be doing this work, but I can't say that as a 20 year old, I would be, or young journalist, I would want to be pigeonholed into the race beat, right? It's like, what do you bring to this? And so in my, from my perspective, we want accountability reporting. Um, we want to do also explanatory stories that otherwise would not be told if it weren't for me and my perspective or my expertise. So one example I'll give is um, har sexual harassment. When the Harvey Weinstein cases were you know, being uncovered by the Times, the New Yorker, it was like a bombshell, right? But this, has been, this is stuff that's been going on for, forever. It was like an open secret in Hollywood. But another open secret was this was happening to black actresses in Hollywood too, um, perpetuated by Halle Berry and Taraji P. Henson's manager. He'd been there for decades. There were countless women that he had harassed and these women's stories were not being told, not even when this spotlight was being shown on what Harvey was doing. So I actually had a Stanford um, friend who was a co term with me shoot me a message on Facebook one day who is a woman of color in Hollywood saying, hey, I'm hearing this. Basically, I know the, the Harvey Weinstein, the Black Hollywood, is this something that the Post would be interested in? And if so, who should I reach out to? And I, I don't have experience covering you know, pop culture or Hollywood, but my beat, which I love, is so broad that I'm like, me, I'll do this story, you know? Like, I'll start talking to people. And initially, you know, none of the women wanted to be on the record, which is pretty common in these cases. It was a very sensitive, personal issue, especially because a lot of them were not high profile actresses. Um, they were not the Halleys and the Taraji's. In fact, Halley and Taraji's names are being dangled before them as something they could be, something they could aspire to if they would give this guy a blowjob or sleep with this guy. You know, it was very much trading on, on their fame. So I felt very proud of that story. Um, it took several months to do. And days after it was published, um, the manager of Vincent Cirincion shuttered his business. Um, so that's an example of accountability reporting that focuses on race, that is, is, is a race story um, that I feel like, well, I mean, it wasn't being told. I also, um, you know, there's a lot of, there is still a lot of conversation about reparations for slavery, rightfully so, and it's, it was started being picked up a couple of years ago, uh, more and more so in the conversation, obviously, um, with the Atlantic story, Atlantic column, excuse me, article by Ta-Nehisi. Um, and I, I was thinking, is there a different way into the reparations story? What, what hasn't been written about reparations? Where, when in the history of our country have reparations been given? And obviously Japanese Americans who were imprisoned during World War II is a very key example. So I was wondering if there's a way to tell that through a personal narrative of some sort. Like there must be an interracial family somewhere that's Japanese American, African-American who can talk deeply about that. And because of my background and, and the connections that we all come with based on who we are, I happen to know a photographer, a female photographer from Detroit um, who is Blasian. And she was in the process of researching her, her father's story, her grandfather's history. Um, he was a Japanese man who was imprisoned and her father is half Japanese, half black. And she helped connect me with some of her sources that she met through her research. Um, ultimately, the family I focused on, the Syfax family, Syfax Yamamoto family, had a fascinating story to tell. The Syfaxes were descendants of people who were enslaved on Mount Vernon. And they were given, you know, 17 acres of land as reparations before the Civil War ended. That land helped seed the family wealth. Um, the Japanese side, the grandfather was um, in prison during World War II, something that just that generation just does not talk about. It is so hurtful. They didn't even want to talk about it with their own kids, right? It was something that they survived. They just want to put it aside and move on. And, um, you know, I just felt privileged to enter their living rooms and, and you know, convince them to share their story. So that's something I felt like as a type of story that wouldn't be told if I weren't telling it. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much. We, we dropped a bunch of links in the chat again, so everybody can read up. You'll have a lot of reading. Well, we all have a lot of, I don't know if we have extra time with COVID, but <laughs> there's a lot of time at home. So potentially you can read up on all of these articles that um, these journalists are bringing to light. Um, so before we transition over to the audience Q&A, um, I'd love to, on that COVID topic, talk about parenting during a pandemic. How have you guys been functioning <laughs> as working mothers during a pandemic? There's been a whole lot uh, written about it, but I'd love to hear about your personal experiences and if you have any advice for other working moms out there. Anyone want to jump in, Emily? First, I mean, I'll jump in. I, like advice, there, it's impossible to provide advice in this moment in history. I think you know, I'll I'll take you back to February and March of uh, 2020. There was a week, so I was trying to fundraise to even get the 19th off the ground. Uh, uh, our fundraising had dried up almost overnight due to COVID, from like $700,000 a month to $37,000 a month. We were having serious conversations about whether we were even going to be able to get off the ground in August as planned. There were like a lot of tears at my dining room table. Uh, and there was a week where my husband had COVID. My kid, of course, was quarantined at home with us. I was trying to do all these fundraising calls on Zoom. I was like stiff arming my kid out of the screen. I mean, it's just, and I have, you know, I'm lucky enough to have a partner. I, you know, I mean, obviously my elderly parents were not able to participate in any of the childcare over the last however many months. But I think for so many of us, this has just been completely unmooring. Um, and to try to navigate for us launching a startup, my organization, the 19th is, you know, there are a whole bunch of working parents on our team. Um, you know, we had, we had launched the 19th saying for COVID, you know, six months of paid family leave, four months of fully paid caregiver leave. If you need to take care of a sick or elderly relative, like hello COVID, this was like pre-pandemic. Um, you know, we ended up offering childcare stipends to the parents on our team in order to give them a little breathing room to help us get to launch. But it has been, um, like impossible doesn't even begin to say what this has been like for any of us who are working parents trying to navigate this moment. So I feel for all of you, for all of us, uh, there have been a lot of tears shed, I think, trying to make a go at this. Um, and I'm just grateful for every week now that my kid is back in daycare without that ominous note home that says a kid in the class has tested positive and everybody has to stay home for the next 14 days. So that I live my life between those 14 day <laughs> gaps. Others, I know. I mean, yeah, it's, it's you know, I re recall by, by like last May, my husband and I looked at each other and we're like, this is unsustainable. This cannot continue. And here we are a, a year later. Um, I am lucky. My, I have a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son. My son's daycare opened in July. Um, and we have been really really lucky. Um, my daughter has been out of school. She just went back to school today for the first time since last March. Um, I know to, that's why I had to check my phone because I got a call and I thought someone had the coronavirus, but uh, she just left this morning. Uh, and, and that's, you know, that's great. But, you know, the way I have, have, have gotten through this is I just have to decide every day, whether I'm going to be a good mother or a good journalist that day. Um, I mean, I'm sure my daughter thinks I'm the best mom in the world still. Um, but, you know, I just decided, I, you just, you just, you, that's, that's how I've gotten through. I say, okay, I can do a really great job with this story this week and Evie will survive. <laughs> and next week I'll make it up to her. It's like, you make these trade-offs, um, but it's been awful. I mean, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a mother. I take it very seriously. It's the joy of my life, having grown up, um, not having my own uh, most of my life. It's really important to me um, to give her everything. And I just realized during, I mean, this, this has been a gift too, because it's made me realize that she does not require perfection. Um, and she, she, she's, that's not what she's looking for. Um, she, she requires presence and a smile and a wink um, and all those little things that, you know, you can't buy. So, uh, but yeah, my dog's barking, of course. Um, but, <laughs> but yeah, I, it's, it's, it's been really, really tough. Lots of tears, um, lots of, of trying to plan for the future and you can't, um, but I really have drawn on my own child's 
resilience and and strength to get to get through it. Damn, that was so inspiring. She doesn't require perfection, but just a smile and a wink. I love it. That's what she, but really, she's the best. <laughs> I remember this um, early on in the pandemic. I mean, I was just going nuts. We lived in this tiny two bedroom condo in DC in Adams Morgan. I'm not a homebody. I don't like to be at home. That's why I'm a reporter. I like to be out in the world, like in the country, in the, in the world. And suddenly we're, we're stuck here. And my son, who's eight, he's in third grade, was doing homeschooling. My husband, who had been working at my son's school, lost his job when schools ended. Um, the bright side is he could take on most of the um, childcare and schooling responsibilities. He already did all the cooking. Um, but I remember, you know, we had, I didn't have an office. I didn't have a desk. I had an ironing board, a 20 year old ironing board that we never used because I don't iron that I used for eight months as a desk sitting on my bed. And our managing editor, Cameron Barr was check doing these uh, impromptu check-ins with just small groups of reporters to just see how we were as people. I remember I was there with like guys who were also parents. Um, and I just started crying. I was like, I could not do this like I feel so bad every time my son came in the room and I'm shushing him and like pushing him away I still do this even though I feel bad I still do this every day so it's just to get the work done it was just um really really difficult so one it was great that there were people at the post who recognized the difficulty reached out and you know un our understanding our editors have been very flexible at the same time during the last year, I feel like I've done some of the best work of my life um, with the protests happening across the country after George Floyd's death. Um, the Washington Post decided to, what is systemic racism? Like we're talking about explanatory reporting and it's something that is thrown around, the phrase is thrown around during the presidential debates, but can we explain it? What does it look like? Is it real? Yes, it's real. How do we show that? And so a team of reporters um, and guided by very smart editors thought, you know, what if we just told the story of systemic racism through George Floyd's life in education, in housing, in criminal justice, in health even, um, what does it look like? And for me, being trapped on that bed and with an ironing board and I, I just, I felt kind of like paralyzed. Like I wanted to be in Houston in the CUNY homes where George Floyd was raised, but the woman that I, been spending weeks on the phone with had COVID. And I just didn't feel like I could risk my family's health that way. It killed me to not be there. Um, but the post, you know, my generous, very talented colleague, Arellis, was already based in San Antonio. She had to go to um, CUNY Homes for her own story about criminal justice and policing. And she generously tagged on, you know, this reporting trip so, I mean, she was just amazing. I would not have been able to get through the pandemic doing the type of work that I'm proud to do if it were not for my colleagues, like Arellis, you know, Robert Samuels. It's just people that you can just call and just vent and just get the work done as a team because we're just stronger that way. So that's the way I got through the last year. I just want to tell you both that, I mean, I have a model for this because of my mom who, you know, so I just want to let you know that here's what the future looks like 20 years from now, your kids are going to be so friggin' proud of you. So filled with pride, the relationship I have with my mom, the love I have for her, the admiration has been, has grown so much because of the work that she did. So anyway, just so you know, you're not going to wake up 20 years from now and have your kids be like, my mom was never around. You're going to have kids who are like, I, I cannot believe the gift I was given of getting to have a mom who is this ambitious. So we hope to have Emily Ramshaw. Yeah. <laughs> Well, my daughter always, and she's, she's also, she, she's really grown a lot. I don't know about you guys, but I've, I feel like she's matured years, um, which makes me sad, but also proud at the same time. Um, she's, she, she also just knows how to advocate for herself. And, you know, I, I used to be able to tell her, you know, when I was working a lot or I was on the road or in Montana, or, you know, getting on a, a flight every other week, you know, I, I would say mommy's, mommy's helping other kids. You know, mommy's doing this because she's helping other kids. 
Um, and thank you so much for sharing mommy with other kids. And I've a few months into the pandemic when the education system shut down and I lost my mind um, for the other kids, right? Um, she, there, she looked at me and she said, well, can those kids share you with me, with me now? And I was like, oh, that is, I'm so proud of you for asking. But it, I mean, obviously it broke my heart, but I was also very proud of her for being able to stand up first. So. I love that. You're a great mom. You need to, you need to write an article about parenting during the pandemic. I think we could all use your insights. You turn it around really into the positive. Being, yeah, mine is <laughs> really good at being like, it, I need you to put your phone down. And I'm like, oh. Oh, oh, the knife. Okay. Exactly. No, for sure. I've heard all of that and, and more. Um, so now let's, let's switch over to uh, audience questions. I know um, you, you, have, you all have so much to share and we're probably not going to get to all the questions. So apologies in advance, but we'll start going through a few of them. Um, so one of them is about um, addressing how, uh, the relative invisibility in media of Asian Americans. In particular, um, why has there been such limited coverage of the rise of anti-Asian hate crimes during COVID until recently? That's a really good question. And I have to say, that's one of the main reasons I stuck in political reporting for so long. It, it was not something that I felt naturally um, prepared or that I was naturally good at. But I felt like it was important that people see me in on the Hill in terms of media representation. People see an Asian American woman on the Hill as a reporter. They, I, it was important that they see me on TV. I hate doing TV hits, but I felt like I needed to represent um, on Fox News, frankly. And um, as far as the lack of coverage, I mean, until recently, there's been a lot more, thankfully. And the push has really been from Asian American journalists who've really been putting it out there. I'm on a Twitter group with some, a lot of Asian American journalists who Slack, who tweet, DM each other every time they have a story up related to this. Um, but there's also been some, frankly, irresponsible reporting of, about this. It's, you have to be careful. Not every crime that, ha that has an Asian American victim is a hate crime. I'm not even just talking about because the stats don't label it that way. That's a whole nother issue. But because of demographics, um, there are different, and in the time of COVID that we're in, um, people are victims and not every victim is a victim of a hate crime. So that's something that we in particular have to be very careful about and be accurate and truthful, truthful about because then there's more, the, the truth matters. Um, so we can't um, blur the lines. I'm not saying that, that an increase in Asian American hate crime is not happening. It, it absolutely is, um, just based on my own reporting. But the stats are, are, are not that good. Um, the Asian American community is also extremely diverse. And, um, you know, when you have a president who goes out there and starts uh, saying racist things and labeling a virus as Kung Flu or the China virus, people are going to see an Asian looking face, whether or not they have any Chinese roots and, and, and um, take it out on them. So that, that absolutely is happening. I've, I've seen it in my reporting of um, Asian American frontline healthcare workers, nurses, Filipino nurses who were spat upon, told to go back to their country. Why did you bring us the China virus? You know, it's, it is happening and um, we have been covering it since last year, but there should be more done. Thank you, Tracy. Um, Erica, there's a question for you, actually two questions for you, um, about how you felt about replacing an older, more seasoned journalist. Um, and also, why do you think the Baltimore Sun told you to write somewhere else after grad school, as this seems to be a common refrain? Um, so how I felt about replacing Susan, I mean, that I, I started in 2010, the Sun went through what we call uh, called the slaughter of 2009, um, and that was devastating. I mean, it was my hometown hometown paper. Um, when I went into the newsroom as a 24 year old, I and and those who remained who had watched their friends walk out of that building, um, I I felt the resentment. 
um, <laughs> it, it was palpable. And, and, um, and I felt, I felt terrible about that. Um, but I was there to do, to do a job and I was there. Um, I did not feel entitled to that job. I knew the conditions I was, I was walking into. Um, and, you know, I think I, um, I brought a level of, of tenacity um, and an old soul, I would say, and a care for the paper because I, I am from Baltimore, right? Um, that won a lot of people over in the end, <laughs> eventually. Um, no, I mean, it, it's just, that was the nature of the business. It was, it was not great. I felt it and all I could do was my best. Um, and I think that that worked out. Um, and there's no greater cheerleader for the Baltimore Sun, even to this day, than than me. I will tell you that the times, the my Times editors, editors will tell you that they think I have one foot there and one foot uh, at the New York Times still. Um, sorry, what was the second question? Oh, how was I? I you know, it's 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 interesting because you back then I was like, but I did all the things. I went to Northwestern. I worked for the Chicago Sun Times for, um, you know, four months. I, I, I thought this was my way in. Um, and I will tell you, if I had not worked at a weekly newspaper, the Frederick Gazette, uh, covering the board of aldermen, the mayor, the zoning board, the historic preservation committee, the pretty cow contest at the great Frederick fair, I would have no idea how to cover a major metropolitan city at a newspaper. I mean, I just didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and it only took 15 months for me to think like, my, my goodness, I can, I can rumble with politicians. I can understand budgets. I can understand, you know, the, the fights over historic signs on buildings and I can cover the hell out of a pretty cow contest too. <laughs> so um, I, the only thing interestingly that I did not cover in Frederick was education. <laughs> um, so, and I used to always see that reporter and say, God, I hope I never have to do that because she was always buried under, under agendas and going to school board meetings at five <laughs> o'clock. So, so no, I, I feel, I just wouldn't, it was invaluable. I mean, by the time I left that weekly newspaper, I competed against a daily in the same town. And our, our paper came out on Thursdays. And when I tell you, they were shook on Wednesday night for what we were gonna have in that paper the next day, um, they, they were. So, so it, it was the, of course I felt a little deflated, but you just, you know, I don't know who I thought I was thinking I was gonna walk from school into, you know, a major metropolitan newspaper. Um, but it didn't take long and I learned a lot. Excellent. Thank you, Erica. Um, so I can't believe it, but we're already almost at the end of our time. And I had a question that I had in mind to wrap up, but I think I'm gonna change course because Lynette Clementson, who's the director of the Knight Wallace Fellowships, <laughs> has a question that I think would be even better as a wrap up. Um, as you report on systemic change, what are your thoughts on what needs to change structurally about journalism? Maybe each of you can touch on that. Maybe Emily could go first. <laughs> <laughs> sure, I mean, structurally what has to change, you know, I mean, I'll beat the dead horse on this, is that newsrooms have to reflect, truly reflect the communities they're seeking to serve. I mean, I think, and I, I think Tracy and Erica might speak to this better than, than I can. So I'll speak to one aspect of this. And that is that, Newsrooms have historically not been great place for women. They have not been great place uh, places for parents. They have not been great places for people who have felt uh, who come from uh, marginalized communities. I mean, I think, you know, one thing we're trying to do to sort of rewrite this course is to provide the kind of benefits that I talked about a little bit earlier. Like, and, you know, can you provide pre-COVID? and post-COVID, truly remote workplaces so our colleagues can work wherever they have the best childcare and elder care setups. Um, can you provide the kind of leave policies that give people the flexibility they need to take breaks um, when they have small kids and, and get back on that sort of escalator to leadership right when they come back? 
can you, you know, we cover 100% of healthcare premiums because that shouldn't be a deterrent for someone. Um, you know, can you give people truly the flexibility that they need to be the best at their jobs? And I think, uh, you know, again, this is all an experiment. You know, can you provide really competitive starting salaries and see if that puts people up on a tier where they don't have to work in those $27,000, $37,000 jobs? So this is, as I said, it's an experiment, but the test work the case we're trying to prove is that if you give people those kinds of opportunities um, at the ground floor, do you suddenly change the face of newsroom leadership, um, you know, three years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? Uh, for me, that's where systemic change begins. And it's the experiment that I'm committed to. I'm going to echo that on term, in terms of pay and internship pay. In the newsrooms I've been fortunate to work for, a lot of print newspapers do pay interns, but a lot of broadcast ones that, um, you know, my fellow journalists coming up through college, they weren't paid as well. They're paid better now at this point in their career, but at, when you're starting out, some of their internships didn't even pay at the local news level. So you're not going to be able to get, diversify your newsroom if you don't pay people because um, just looking at the pipeline of the people who are in college, first of all, news, news journalists didn't used to have to have had a college education, right? You were like, a, a, that was not where you were getting educated. You were getting educated in the real world. And without that starting base of, uh, if you're going to get someone to DC or New York or any expensive city and not pay them, who's going to be able to afford those internships? There's, they're going to be gotten through connections and people whose parents are wealthy enough to subsidize that. I would say that newsrooms need to be, <clears throat> do a, a lot of reflection about their culture. Um, the Times just, you know, I'm not going to echo, I echo what Emily and Tracy said, so I'll try to, to add something. Um, you know, the Times just did this. Um, they published a big report. Um, that took a real hard look at um, at, at, at the culture and it, it really explained why the efforts to diversify the newsroom have been so difficult. They can bring in talent, they cannot retain Black uh, employees, particularly Black women. Um, and I thought that was just really, really telling. I mean, I, I think, you know, newsrooms, as especially as they look to diversify, um, I think they've gotten um, a little complacent thinking that uh, just bringing journalists of color in is enough. Um, I think we can often be treated like we should just be um, happy to have a seat at the table, but nobody wants what we're serving. Um, and that needs to change. Um, and I think that's really, really, really hard work. I think you can pay, you can increase pay, you can increase numbers but really reflecting on whether or not you actually want um, what a diverse newsroom brings is much, much more difficult. Uh, can I jump in again to, um, yes. I know we're, <laughs> we're nearing the end, but I wanted to say this is, applies to so many different um, sectors, right? Not just the journalism field. And we're talking about, earlier we we're talking about potentially being better allies in, in this fight. And I was thinking about the Obama administration, the Obama White House, when women were at the table, but they were not being heard, their ideas, it just was like they weren't there. And so the thing that the women in the Obama White House did was amplify. When they heard one of their colleagues say something, someone else would say it and attribute it and give them credit and eventually with enough people amplifying these great ideas, they are heard. And that's something that we can all do in our own newsrooms for our colleagues and in whatever profession you work in. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank you so much to all of you for taking time out of your very busy schedules. I know the news cycle never stops <laughs> and you know it better than I. Um, so really, we appreciate it um, from all of us at Stanford Women's Network New York and all of the various other clubs who helped us cross promote. We really appreciate all the cross promotion efforts. Um, and we will be having more talks like this. Maybe we'll even invite everyone back again if they want to join us because I have a lot, we have a lot of questions for you that didn't get answered. Um, apologies to those in the audience who asked and didn't 
didn't get an answer. Um, but we will send an email with the links to the articles that were mentioned during this panel and with links to the 19th newsletter. Um, and we're really happy, really happy to have had these amazing panelists with us and really happy that all of you who attended joined us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.